for this morning is Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7 through verse 13. Uh, you'll recognize this, of course, as the letter of our Lord to the church in Philadelphia. We're going to spend two times on uh, this letter because in the 10th verse of the third chapter in which our Lord gives promise because they have kept the word of his patience. He will keep them from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That text has been a subject of considerable discussion and debate, and so we'll spend just a little bit of time on it, and uh, therefore, we will extend our study of this particular letter to next Sunday as well. But now will you listen as I read through the letter beginning with the seventh verse through the 13th. And remember, I'm reading from the authorized version and uh, your version will probably have some differences here and there, but no really major ones in this particular letter. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven and from God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to Thee for the privilege that is ours. We thank Thee for the Word of God which we have just read. We ask that as we study the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Scriptures, may teach us and instruct us and build us up in our faith. We thank Thee for the power of the Word of God. And we thank Thee for the way in which it does work within our hearts to conform us to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for the constant work of sanctification which He performs in every believer. And Lord, we pray that we may be responsive. So often, we are not responsive. We are rebellious. We turn away from the things that are so plain to us in the Word of God. Deliver us, Lord, from such sin. We pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ today on this, the Lord's Day, the day in which we meet and remember that he is a living Savior at the right hand of the throne of God and there ever lives to make intercession for those whom he has brought into relationship with the Lord, with the Lord and also those whom he has chosen and will bring into that relationship. 
What a marvelous teaching the Word of God gives us that even at this very moment our Lord is praying for those who know Him. And Father, we ask Thy blessing upon this local assembly as well, upon its leadership. We commit them to Thee. We pray that each of them may be given wisdom and guidance as they have oversight over us in the things of the Lord. And Father, we would particularly bring before Thee those who have requested our prayers, those who are sick and ill and who have other problems and trials that some of the others of us do not seem to have. We pray for them. We ask that Thou wilt give encouragement and comfort and healing within Thy will and may Thy perfect name be exalted in them and in all of us. We pray for the other meetings of this day. We pray also for our country. We ask thy, present, thy, thy blessing upon our president and for the other governmental authorities under whom we live. Give them wisdom and guidance. Deliver them from sin. And may, as a result, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be proclaimed freely. And Father, for each of us individually, by thy grace, so work in our hearts that we may have great desires to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve thee faithfully, to be effective testimonies to our friends and in our family, that our Savior may be exalted and that those whom we know and love may enter into the knowledge of him, which means eternal life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The subject for today as we continue our exposition of the apocalypse is kept from the hour of trial, and that will be the topic for next Sunday as well. As we noted when we were reading the scriptures, this is our Lord's letter to the church at Philadelphia. Remember as we've been going along, we've been commenting from time to time concerning the historical interpretation that has often been taken of these churches, and namely that they represent periods in the history of the Christian church from the time of our Lord on through to the present day. We've suggested that that cannot really be done very successfully, but nevertheless there are some indications of a relationship to that that have been pointed out by students of this book. This particular church, the church at Philadelphia, is a church in which there is no complaint against them registered by our Lord. And so according to this historical view, Philadelphia represents the revolt of the 18th and 19th centuries from the empty orthodoxy and falsity of the systems which grew up during the 16th and 17th centuries as a result of the Reformation. Not as a natural result of the Reformation, but the kind of thing that often happens in any, incident, in any work of the Lord. This happens in a local church as well, usually beginning with the zealousness, the interest, the fervor of new Christians, and then as the generations unfold, the things that characterize the early stages of the church become the sterile, well-known, familiar kinds of things that lead to lack of excitement, lack of zeal, lack of concern, and to put it frankly and forthrightly to the deadness that characterizes 
many of our evangelical churches. Second, third, and fourth generation Christians frequently manifest that characteristic in their lives. Their fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers became believers in our Lord, were fervent Christians, zealous in the things of the Lord, soul winners, testimonies constantly, but then as the generations unfold, the deadness enters in. It's one of the perils that all of us face. So Philadelphia, according to the historical view, represents the revolt of the 18th and 19th centuries with, for example, the Wesleyan revivals and some of the other revivals that characterize that time. Now, whether that's true or not, it's rather doubtful, actually, that that's a way in which we could interpret these letters, even though they unfold in this way, and one might think that they represent the progress of the Christian truth during the age between the first and second coming of our Lord. Still, this is a church that is rich in the Lord's approval. No reproof is given to the church itself. It represents the Spirit's movement to restore the freshness of the early church according to that view of this particular church. It has been variously identified with the Quakers, believe it or not, with the Puritans, with the Methodists, and also with the Brethren. It is certainly true that in many of our churches this coldness and deadness exists. When I think of that, I think of a story that I read some time ago about a man who was a janitor in a rather exclusive Park Avenue church in New York City. And he had been in the church for a time, and finally he went to the pastor and he asked the pastor if he could join the church. And the pastor, after some discussion with him, suggested that he should ask the Lord about it. And so seeing him sometime later, the pastor asked him about the matter, and the janitor replied, well, yes, pastor, I asked the Lord about it, and he told me not to get discouraged because he's been trying to get in for 20 years himself. <laughs> well, as we look at so many churches and think of evangelicalism as a fervent interest in the things of the Lord, well, I think we can appreciate that, but the condition itself of deadness and coldness and sterility is something that we should guard against, not simply as an assembly, because the way in which an assembly manifests its life is the product of the way in which we individually manifest our Christian lives. So when we talk about a church being dead, we should be very careful that we are not one of the reasons for that. At any rate, Philadelphia represents perhaps a different kind of church. It's a feeble church, but it's a faithful body and thought by many students to be a church challenged to a new vision and opportunity under the sovereignty of God because in the eighth verse, our Lord says, I know your works. I have set before you an open door. And therefore, thought to be perhaps a church which is located in just such an area that it might be a means of reaching a new territory for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, specifically, Philadelphia was located in such a place that it did have an excellent geographical opportunity to reach Lydia and Phrygia, and particularly Phrygia, which was a rather wild country at that time. By others, as they look at Philadelphia, they look at this church as a church consoled after excommunication from the synagogue. In verse 7, we read, for example, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And that in the light of verse 9, behold, I will make 
them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Uh, this has been thought by them who look at this church in this way, as a church consoled after excommunication, as our Lord's word of consolation to them. It's true, you have been put out of the synagogue because of your faith in me, but the time is coming when I am going to bring it about that they come and worship before your feet, those very ones who have put you out of the synagogue. And uh, the setting before them of an open door is looked at as a promise of an open door into the messianic kingdom. Well, let's look at the epistle, and as I say, we'll spend a little time on verse 10 and then finish the exposition next Sunday, the Lord willing. In the seventh verse, our Lord has a word for the addressees, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. Now, Philadelphia was located 35 miles southeast of Sardis, that is, the letter that we expounded last Sunday. So 35 miles south and east of Sardis, about 100 or so miles from Ephesus now, lay the city of Philadelphia. It was founded by Attalus II of Pergamum and founded in the second century before Christ. It was a missionary area. The aim of the founding of the church was to be a missionary of Greek culture. In fact, it was the intent of those who founded the city to bring Greek culture and the Greek language to Lydia and to Phrygia. And as we've noticed in each of the letters, there has been a connection between the history of the church and the location of the church with the spiritual life of the church that is there. Sir William Ramsey, who spent a whole lifetime in archaeological work in Asia Minor, has said that Philadelphia was the center for the diffusion of Greek language and Greek letters in a peaceful land and by peaceful means. That's what our Lord means, he and others thought, when he speaks of the open door that is set before Philadelphia. Today there is a city in Philadelphia and surprisingly it's one of the few places where there is still a Christian church, that is a professing Christian church with a bishop. That city today called al has been thought by a few commentators to be a reference to al which would mean the city of God. And if that were its name, I cannot really be absolutely certain of that. It would make sense in the light of verse 12 where we read him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. So there might some, be some connection there, but it's a rather doubtful kind of connection. So this is the church to which our Lord addresses the letter that has the statement about the open door toward the east. The description that is given of our Lord is different from the other descriptions. We've noticed as we were reading through, at least I hope you have noticed this, I hope you're reading the book of Revelation. You get so much out, more out of an exposition if you're reading the book yourself during the week. But we've noticed that in the descriptions that are given of our Lord in the beginning of each of these letters in chapters 2 and 3, that the description of him is taken from the vision of chapter 1. And in this case, we have something that is different. In the case of the church in Sardis, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the reference to the seven spirits and the seven stars is taken from the vision in chapter 1. But now for the first time in the description of the Lord, we have a description of him that is not taken from the vision of chapter 1. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, 
He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. It is a remarkable threefold picture. The first is a description of his character. These are the words that are used of his character. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. The word holy is a very interesting word because it's a word that speaks of separation. It's not the kind of word that we think of when we think of something holy. We think usually of something intrinsically holy. Well, that's a product of the meaning of this word, but what this word really means is set apart, separate, different. For example, we might say about this pulpit that it is holy in biblical language. Now, it's not holy intrinsically. It's not even holy because I'm standing behind it. Surely not that. But it's holy because it is set apart for a particular purpose. Now, of course, if the purpose is a biblical purpose, then there should be some sense of intrinsic holiness involved in it with reference to for example, to the saints or the holy ones of the Lord, every believer, as we so often said, and as you know, every believer in the Bible is called a holy one. That means that we are set apart for him. We belong to him. We're different from the world about us. We are in the world. We are not of the world because we are holy ones. We are saints. All of us are saints. And you can put that before your name in the biblical sense. Now, when we read concerning our Lord that he is the Holy One, we are talking about one who is set apart for, by our Lord for the ministry that is given to him. And of course, his ministry is the preeminent ministry of the Messianic King, and in his case, he is not only set apart for a specific task, but intrinsically, he is the absolutely holy Son of God, delivered from all reference to evil. He is also described as true. Now, that is a word which means genuine. There are two different words in the New Testament frequently used for true. One means true as over against false. The other means true as over against that which is spurious. And that's the sense of this word. It's the genuine Lord. Now, the genuineness is the genuineness of his messianic calling and also the genuineness of his deity. He's not like the idols, for example. So he's the holy and true one. Putting it all together, he's the sovereign Lord who is set apart for the things of the messianic ministry. If you'll turn over for a moment to chapter 6 and verse 10, you'll see these words again associated in that particular way. In chapter 6 we read, and this in the vision of the opening of the seals, and Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and genuine, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So the thought then is of the genuine God, the sovereign Lord. That's the description that is given of him here in verse 7. He that is holy, he that is true. He that is set apart for the messianic ministry, ultimately to rule over the earth, and genuine as over against all false claimants to the office of Messiah, such as existed in the synagogue, that he was not the Messiah, the true Messiah. He is the genuine Messiah and true in the sense of the genuine messianic divine figure. What is rather interesting about all of this is this fact. These words, holy and genuine, are words that are found in the Old Testament with reference to Yahweh. Now, 
those of you who are who have been here a long time, at least you've heard these words. Maybe it hasn't dawned on you yet, but you've heard the words. They've been flying around in this auditorium that when we use the term Yahweh or Jehovah, we're talking about the Old Testament deity. And we have made the point in the light of the doctrine, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, that there is one God who subsists in three persons that we may call each of the persons Yahweh. We should never associate Jehovah or Yahweh with the Father alone. We speak of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we may speak of Yahweh the Father, Yahweh the Son, Yahweh the Spirit, or Jehovah the Father, Jehovah the Son, Jehovah the Spirit. Please remember that. Because if we don't, we have an inadequate conception of the Christian fundamental doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, what is startling about this, if you haven't noticed this before, is that these terms that are used, holy and genuine, are terms that are used in the Old Testament of Yahweh. For example, I'll just turn to a couple of places quickly in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. I'm sure you're familiar with that passage. This is the chapter in which Isaiah receives his call from the Lord. We read in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings. With twain He covered His face, with twain He covered His feet, and with twain He did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. It's often been commented upon uh, to this effect that the fact that we read holy, holy, holy is a reference to the three personalities of the Trinity. That I do not think can be established exegetically, but it's not out of harmony with that. In chapter 43 and verse 15, we read these words with reference to the the God described in this book. We read in Isaiah 43, 15, these words, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Creator of Israel, your King. Notice, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Creator of Israel, your King. Now, what you if you think about this for a moment, what you read in the book of Revelation when the Lord Jesus is described here in the seventh verse as He that is holy and He that is true, what we find is that our Lord is taking terms that in the Old Testament apply to the Old Testament deity, the one who made the covenant with Israel, the one who brought them out of the land, the one whom they worshiped, He's taking those terms that apply to Yahweh or to Jehovah and applying them to Himself. In other words, He is making the claim that He is the Yahweh of the Old Testament, that He is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Remembering that the Father may be said to be that, the Son and the Spirit also may be said to be that too. So He's the Holy One. And the one who is that supreme deity, is our Lord Himself. Therefore, we're not surprised to read in the remainder of the text, He that hath the key of David. For if the expression holy and genuine describes His character and His being, this describes His authority. It's a reference to His Davidic authority. So, he is the one who has the key of David. The reference here is to an Old Testament event in which in Hezekiah's day, Eliakim became the one who possessed the key of David. And in possessing the key of David, he was the one who possessed the authority and the power under Hezekiah 
in his rule. And so when our Lord is said to possess the key of David, he is in effect said to be the one who has the authority to open up the kingdom for those who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Te Deum has it, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. That belongs to the one who has the key of David. I suggest that you read Isaiah chapter 22 in which the oracle against Shebna is given by Isaiah who was Hezekiah's major domo and he was to be removed from his office and replaced by Eliakim. And concerning the new chief steward, the text says, I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. The language of Isaiah is used by our Lord here to express the fact that he has absolute authority to introduce anyone to and into the Davidic kingdom. The messianic rule. And then finally in the seventh verse his activity is described. He's the author of opportunity for salvation. He says, he that openeth no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. This is the word for not simply the church at Philadelphia but this is the word for believers chapel. Incidentally he does not say he can open but he does open. That is, he's not talking about his ability, he's talking about his activity. And so the term open is designed to encourage the church at Philadelphia to let them realize that God opens and shuts doors of opportunity and we should take advantage of those that he is opening. There's a marvelous little story I think that illustrates some things about a local church and I think has some application to Believer's Chapel. Many years ago a Chinese preacher came to this country and told a friend of mine who was a preacher this story. It appears that there was a church on the mainland of China that heard the reputation of a certain Chinese minister and they wrote inviting him to come for special meetings. Some time went by and they received no answer to their letter Again they wrote urging him to come, but he refused to come. They wouldn't take no for an answer, and after several attempts to procure him, they wrote a letter enclosing a first class ticket on the train, round trip from his city to theirs. And then he answered and he said he would come for three days, and he told them to advertise the meeting only among believers, as he wanted to talk to the Christians. So on the first night he was there and the preliminary part of the service was concluded in good style and then the well-known and noted preacher which they had never heard stood up to speak. He asked the audience how many knew what he was going to talk about and called upon them to hold up their hands. No hands were raised. And so he said, if you do not know what I'm going to talk about, why were you so eager to have me come? I am not going to preach to you tonight. Let's have a prayer meeting. Well, the people were somewhat chagrined and said to themselves, tomorrow night if he asks that question, we must all put up our hands and say we know what he's going to talk about. And sure enough, he began the service the next night, his part, and he asked them how many knew what he was going to talk about. And everybody raised their hand. This time he said, well, if you all know what I'm going to talk about, there's no need for me to tell you, so let's have another prayer meeting. So they had another prayer meeting. Well, the chagrin of the church members was even more pronounced, and they got together and they decided that the next and the last night of the meetings, they would divide. Half of them would say they knew what he was going to talk about, and half would say they don't know what he's going to talk about. And so when he went through the same pattern and he saw there was a division in the house, he said, those who know must tell those who do not know. Let's have another prayer meeting. And when the prayer meeting was over, instead of dismissing the audience as on the two previous nights, the minister talked to them very briefly. He said, a revival 
within a church is not the question of a new voice or a new presentation of the truth. There was all, there'll always be revival when those who know tell those who do not know. And of course, as a result of this, there was a rather deep searching of the heart of the members of the congregation, and I'm sure that they received a lesson which they never forgot. In the eighth verse, our Lord commends the church. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. This is an encouraging word of approval. A little strength. Few in number, but strong in him. Now, I think when he says a little strength, that he means there are just few Christians. In other words, he's talking primarily about numbers, not about the quality of the spiritual life. But there were relatively few in that territory. He says of them that they have kept his word. That in itself is something that is a remarkable commendation. The world today laughs at those who keep the word of the Lord, and even in the Christian church. There is an unwitting tendency toward that. We're asked to abandon Genesis to Psalms. We're asked to abandon salvation by redemption to anthropology and particularly the life of the Spirit as taught in the New Testament in the ministries of men like Paul and John to psychology. Not to speak of the abandonment of the Word to higher criticism, but here is a group who have kept His Word. You can always be sure that ultimately God and His Word will stand justified. And finally he says, you have not denied my name. The rallying center incidentally of a church is Christ, not the church, but Christ himself. I was reading a little hymn that's addressed really to children. It has this stanza, and when he hung upon the tree, they wrote this name above him, that all might see the reason we forevermore must love him. We loved to sing around our King and hailed Him and hail Him, Blessed Jesus, for there is no word ear ever heard so dear, so sweet as Jesus. So they have not denied His name. There is a complaint that is addressed in verse 9 to the church, but not so much of the church as of others. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee." The Jews, who at that time had been very, very strongly opposed to Christianity, had excommunicated many of the believers in this area, evidently, will be forced to worship at the feet of our Lord and at the feet of those who belong to Him. So far as I know, this is the only place in this book where forceful worship is referred to. And then we come in verse 10 to the promise to the church. He says, because you have kept the word of my patience, not just patience, but the word of my patience, that is, the truth of the second advent is evidently in his mind. I also will keep thee from the hour of testing which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now this raises the question of the rapture of the church. Let me just say a word about this. Rapture is a term that's not found in the New Testament, but the idea is to be caught up as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is to be raptured. In fact, the term that is used in the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation, is a term that we derive our English word rapture from. 
Rapio, that verb, means to seize or to catch. And so in the Latin version, that term is used from which we get rapture. Occasionally you'll find people say, the term rapture is not even in the Bible. Well, it's true in the sense of a reference to the second coming and our meeting him in the air. The term, the English word rapture is not found. But when Paul says we shall be caught up to meet him in the air, that is the rapture. And it's very untrue to biblical language to say the term rapture is not in the Bible as if the Bible doesn't speak about a catching up of the church. The issue that disturbs a number of people is the question of whether this catching up of believers shall occur before the time of the tribulation that precedes our Lord's second advent to the earth, or whether the rapture follows that time of tribulation, that time of great trouble upon the earth, before the kingdom of our Lord upon the earth. So we have such terms as the pre-tribulational rapture, meaning that our Lord is caught up before the time of tribulation that precedes the kingdom, and post-tribulational rapture, meaning that the believers are caught up after the tribulation, but still pre-millennial, that is, before the kingdom of God upon the earth. And as you know, there's been a great deal of discussion over it, a great deal of debate over it. Part of the confusion and the complexity that has arisen is re a result from the fact that the issue is largely one of inference drawn from texts and from supposed doctrines or presumed doctrines, I should say. That is, they may be right, but they are presumed to be right. And then the questions of whether the church is to be caught up before the tribulation period is an inference from these statements or from these doctrines. That causes confusion and it causes complexity. It would be nice, the issue would be settled if we had a number of texts that spoke plainly to that issue. That is, if we could point to a text that said, our Lord will come for the church after the tribulation period. That would settle the issue, but we don't have such a passage. And there is only one passage that has been thought to be a specific statement that our Lord will come before the tribulation. And that's this text. Philip, uh, Revelation 3.10, the church at Philadelphia. So what we have then is a lot of debate about inferences and presumed doctrines and inferences from them. Now what I'd like to do in just a few more minutes is to review the question and I'll just begin with saying a few things about the arguments that have been suggested for pre-tribulationalism. That is that our Lord will come before the tribulation, catch the church up to meet him in the air. Following that, there will be the time of great trial upon the earth. The judgments of the later chapters of the book of Revelation will fall at that time. Following which, our Lord will come to the earth, bringing the church that was caught up before the tribulation with him in order to enter into the kingdom of God upon the earth. There are three important arguments that have been offered for a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. One is the argument from imminency, the claim that the Bible teaches that the coming of our Lord is imminent. And if it is imminent, then how can we say that the coming will follow the tribulation? If the coming is imminent, well, then we must have a pre-tribulational rapture. Now, you must understand that words have different meanings depending upon those who give them definitions. What does imminency mean? 
The facts are that both pre-tribulationalists and post-tribulationalists believe in imminency if you admit, if you allow them to define their terms. A pre-tribulationalist believes in imminency, but he means by that an any moment return. That is that our Lord may return now, the next 10 minutes, tomorrow. So he understands imminency as meaning he may return at any moment. Well, those who teach the post-tribulationalists believe rather that Imminency means that it is possible that our Lord may return at any time, but time for them is a short period of time. Now he contends that if you will look at the Bible exegetically, you will find that that second meaning is truer to the text. And those who take the other view, the pre-tribulational view, they will say, if you look at the text, it supports our view. Now frankly, I think in this particular point the post-tribulationists have a bit more biblical support because verbs used to express the attitudes of believers to the coming of our Lord do not support the idea of an any moment return. For example, the very same word that describes how a Christian is to respond to the coming of the Lord, to expect it is used in the, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7, is used in Romans chapter 8 of the expectation of the renewal of the earth, which even pre-tribulationalists believe is an event that follows the tribulation period. So the idea of imminence as he may return at any moment is not true to the language of the New Testament. Any moment is not really the meaning of imminency than exegetically. Let me give you another illustration of that. Our Lord tells parables in which he expects a delay in his coming. You'll find them in Luke chapter 21, a number of other places. When he describes what's going to come to pass, he describes things that are going to transpire on the earth and he speaks of a delay. So in other words, our Lord's language is not suitable for any moment coming. Let me give you an even clearer example perhaps, if these texts are not all that clear to you. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus said, Remember, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now when he says that they are going to be witnesses to the uttermost part of the earth, what's required by that? Well, time is required by that. Could we say at this very moment then that the coming of the Lord is imminent? Could it occur at that time? Well, no, it could not occur at that time because he's already said these things are going to transpire in the future. So the idea of imminency, as expressed by many of the proponents of the pre-tribulational view as being he may return at any moment, is really not true to the biblical language. I think it is much truer to say that imminency means the possibility of his return at any time, but time in that instance means a short period of time. That argument, therefore, I do not think is one that may be used with reference to this question. Now there is another argument from the necessity of an interval between the rapture and the advent, but since our time is really up, I'm going to stop at this point and pick this up next Sunday and go on from this point and finish also the exposition of the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Let me just close by saying it's very clear that our Lord, when he writes this letter to the church at Philadelphia, lays great stress upon fidelity. Fidelity to the Word of God, fidelity to our Lord. The test of the church's loyalty is fidelity to Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us.
as we think about the things of the Word of God to remember that fidelity to Him, faithfulness to His Word, faithfulness to our Lord is really the test that you and I must face up to. If you're here today and you've never believed in Christ, we remind you that the door to salvation, entrance into the kingdom, is open to those who respond to the saving work of Christ, His atoning sacrifice, and His offer of eternal life through that which He has accomplished for sinners. And so if God has brought you to the conviction that you are a sinner and abide under divine condemnation, come to Christ, trust Him, believe in Him, and pass from death to life. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are thankful to Thee for the privilege of the ministry of the Word of God, and may our hearts, the hearts of each one of us, be responsive to the truth. Enable us to carefully read and ponder the Word of God, and above all, by Thy grace, enable us to be faithful to that Word and to Him of whom it speaks our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and has loosed us from our sins in His precious blood. We pray in His name. Amen.